The City Council voted 5-4 to four today to add LGBT protections to its housing discrimination ordinance in Oklahoma City. The Oklahoman's William Crum reports besides adding protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity, the update adds protections for familial status, disability and age. Oklahoma City's updated housing discrimination protections take effect February 4th. One is, is an amendment uh, and then 9E2 is an ordinance. and. Um, this has to do with our municipal codes, and I know, Ed, you've been working on this amendment to, uh, to make an addition, and we have some people that have signed up to speak. So I, I might reserve my comments until after they've had a chance to speak, but I do want to acknowledge Randy Stallings from the Planning Department for this great report on the Human Rights Commission. I really appreciate the thoroughness and, and reaching out to all these peer cities and, and all the research. I think it's just outstanding work. I don't know if we could hear from the planning department about maybe to present this research. I mean, just a synopsis for those who might not have access to it. Chris Vargas is here. Well, Randy's here too, but Chris is probably be the point person. You want to? Yeah, given the time restrictions that we had, we tried to do an email survey with the various communities, specifically those that were a little bit larger than Oklahoma City on a population basis. Uh, we were able to determine that the majority of those cities do have human resources commissions. Those that don't typically have a city department that's committed to that process and would serve the same function as an HRC in those communities. Um, we found typically those commissions are supported with general funds. Uh, some do see, receive support from EEOC and HUD on a reimbursement basis, but typically the financial support does come from the city. Uh, we felt that given the information that we had available that Oklahoma City really is in a pretty fair position in comparison to the other communities as far as how we handle our claims by partnering through the Metro Fair Housing Council for the investigation of housing discrimination complaints. Uh, we found that the majority of the communities in regards to employment discrimination typically would handle those through a city department. Fort Worth. Fort Worth apparently allows, there's an opportunity for a civil action in municipal court for violation of agreed upon provision. That's correct. Fort Worth will generally go through a, a litigation process with their human resources board. Uh, through that process, they'll come to an agreement that's a document between the two parties at the table. In the event that one of those parties violates that agreement, then they do have the opportunity to file a civil action in municipal court. So basically, you looked at, you looked at 14 cities. 12 of them have human rights commissions. Two of them, I guess, maybe are prohibited by statute in Tennessee. From that is correct, yes, sir. Lawton, Norman, Tulsa all have human rights commissions in the state of Oklahoma. Lawton was not included in our research. Tulsa and uh, Norman both have human resources commissions, yes, sir. How, how many of these cities have protections in terms of housing for the or sexual orientation and gender identity? LGBT was running, typically about 80% of those communities would have some type of protection. Uh, those that weren't able to enforce it with ordinance typically had an opportunity to keep an advocate on staff to keep the mayor and the city council appraised of those issues in the community. Okay. Welcome. All right, so Ed's amendment in, uh, is, is to add uh, sexual orientation protection uh, as in regards to housing which is, and goes above and beyond the, 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 the requirements by the federal law, but it's something that this council will either agree needs to be done or, or does not. Well, actually, I wanted to ask for clarification on that, maybe. Because um, one, one thing, I'm not sure it was in this report I read, is the city now in some of its contracts, including sexual orientation and gender identity, under just the term sex for its contracts with? I don't know the answer to that. And that was my question as well, because it's already addressed yeah, in that language. And I was trying to, I was struggling. I mean, I certainly support the concept of the amendment, but I was really struggling with whether it was necessary or not, because it appears that it is already addressed. If, if there's consensus that that's the city's policy, that when we say sex, we are automatically including sexual orientation and gender identity, I agree with you. But that's not clear to me that that is the council's policy. And I would agree it wasn't clear to me either. So. Um, 
So I don't know whether it's included in the, there is a provision in the code that's not shown on this that, that deals with contractors, but I, I don't believe it includes gender identity or sexual orientation. That's when we contract with in, with, with uh, Is that like when we contract with the Metropolitan Housing Authority, or what are we talking about? The goods, are, sure goods or services or construction contract. I don't believe that, that these two particular items are included in that at all. I thought I read that in one of the reports, but I, I could be. OK. Well, we have some people that have signed up to yeah. speak. You want to bring them up? I'll ask each of the people to keep their comments to three minutes or less. Philip Douglas? Um, Good morning, Phil. We'll need your name and address for the record, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Philip Douglas. I live at <clears throat> 3117 Northwest 62nd Street, Oklahoma City, 73112, in the second ward. Um, I am a uh, retired minister, and uh, as a minister and a Christian, I want to uh, uh, commend the, uh, the, uh, the council for taking, for talking about this, and I just want to want my city be known as a non-discriminating and fair place. Uh, that's uh, I appreciate your work on this, and uh, that's all I really had to say. Thank all you, right. sir. Philip, thank you. Troy Stevenson. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, just for your edification, I brought these uh, booklets. They're actually from the Human Rights Campaign and the Equality Federation, which are our national partners. They index uh, just about every major city in the nation and which protections they do and do not have. Um, this is, I, I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but it's something that's taken very seriously by corporations and businesses across the nation when they're considering where to relocate their businesses and where to bring business. Um, Oklahoma City actually ranks as one of the lowest cities on it, in this index as far as the protections for the LGBT community. I think the amendment that's here today will address housing, but we also uh, lack protections for employment for anybody other than municipal employees. Um, we lack protections in public spaces, meaning that, that folks could be theoretically kicked out of a restaurant for being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Uh, this is something that, that definitely hurts the image of Oklahoma City in front of the nation and in front of corporations that would like to come here. And we hope that you will take this first step in addressing that. I, I know that there's been some communication about the fact that this might not have teeth. This amendment uh, that was proposed today, we, we don't think it goes far enough. We do believe that a human rights commission is absolutely necessary. We do believe that protection should be there for employment and for public spaces to make sure that all citizens of Oklahoma City are protected. But I want to make it clear that there are, there are teeth in this amendment. Um, the two authorities that this would go to, the Attorney General's uh, Office of Civil Rights could act upon this. HUD could act upon this. They both have the authority to take action. And right now, whether that's going to happen or not, whether you think it might or not, there is no recourse for, for an LGBT citizen of Oklahoma City who gets kicked out of their home or who gets denied a loan, this would at least give them the legal authority, the legislative intent of this body saying that Oklahoma City does not believe discrimination is okay. Uh, I would ask you to take a look at this. I would ask you, regardless of how this vote goes today, that we continue this conversation, not just about housing, but about protections for the entire community. Thank you. All right, thanks. Troy, feel free to pass those out. Um, Paula Sophia Schonauer. Welcome back, Paula. Thank you, sir. Um, Paula Sophia Schonauer, 709 Northwest 28th Street, Oklahoma City. Um, I'm here to support the amendment for inclusion of sexual orientation or, and gender identity. Specifically, I want to speak to gender identity. Um, ten, over 10 years ago, um, I had a disagreement with the Oklahoma City Police Department and I was struggling to keep my job 
And during that process, they determined that gender identity or the word transgender was not a protected class. And by virtue of that language not being included, uh, there was found to be no policy violations. So the EEOC would not take my case, and the city continued to try to uh, move me along, and I almost was fired, one step away from being fired. What I wanted to see is that in 10 years, we've made a lot of progress. There was a happy ending to my story. We came to a settlement. Um, the progress that we've seen is nationally and in the federal government that gender identity has been included in, in sex discrimination by the EEOC, but specific language, lacking specific language and administrative change, and administration change, excuse me, will, um, could, could turn against us and render us inv invisible. What transgender people want is basic things, housing, employment, to be able to live our lives. Most of us live our lives very quietly and we're law-abiding citizens, very talented, very intelligent people, denied access to, to the basic things of life. So I want this city, please, to uh, make a strong statement about full inclusion and include gender identity in the language and send a strong message to the rest of the state and the country as a whole. Thank you. All right, Paula, thanks. Amanda McLean Snipes. Good morning. Good morning. I have to excuse me, I'm quite nervous. I've never done this before. Uh, my name is Amanda McLean Snipes. I reside at 2825 Lakeside Drive in the village. Just a few months ago on September 5th, my wife Kate and I were married in Oklahoma City. Our hometown in front of friends and family and our church after six years of dating, 15 years of friendship. As we sit in chambers today, loan paperwork rests on our coffee table for Kate and I's first house, a home we hope to start making in Oklahoma City in the next couple of months. I was born and raised in Oklahoma City. I grew up riding my bike around the streets of Quell Creek, enjoying Brahms on a hot summer day and nothing soothes me more than a loud, crashing spring thunderstorm. I'm a daughter of our city, and I also happen to be gay. Raised to leave things better than I found them, I learned that if something is not fair, it's not sufficient to sit on the sidelines and complain. Since I love our community, it is my responsibility to be part of the solution. That's why I'm here today. In the past, I did not disclose to a landlord the true nature of my relationship with my then girlfriend, now wife. I did so because I was afraid. Afraid to come home and see changed locks. Afraid to be thrown out overnight. Afraid we'd lose all of our property. Afraid that we would lose everything we were working for. You see, when you live in a community that doesn't outright accept you, you go into a mode where you just want to be invisible. You want to live and let live. You minimize your risk. You minimize your exposure. I come to talk to you today because we're a thriving community. Our city is growing. We're fair-minded. We're resilient. Today is the day we can turn the page. Today is the day we get to say, yes, you are protected. Yes, you are worthy. Yes, you are home. All anyone wants is to work hard day in and day out and get a fair shake at life. Let's make sure the playing field is even. I ask you to vote today to update the city's housing ordinance to protect our neighbors, our friends, and our families from discrimination. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Mark Hendrickson. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I'm Mark Henriksen. I'm a lawyer here in Oklahoma City. My address is 600 North Walker. I uh, congratulate Councilman Shadid for s proposing this, and I, I think that this ordinance is best described as a baby step of progress, but it is probably to be described as a step of progress. A few years ago, this council made history by adopting a policy of non-discrimination as to the LGBT community within your municipal hiring. And this would be a further step in that it would be, I believe, the first action by this body 
that would regulate transactions that did not include the city. And so that would be another historic step forward. It's a shame that in 2016 we still need laws to prevent the effects of discrimination. I don't think you can have a law that prevents discrimination itself. Discrimination is really the fear of otherness. In talking to some of you, and I've been hearing some of the concern is that this ordinance does not have adequate enforcement mechanisms, and that's a concern about supporting it. Well, you know, that's somewhat a, a legitimate objection. On the other hand, this ordinance, if adopted, would provide the same protection to the LGBT community that has been on the books for many years for the other protected uh, groups regarding housing discrimination. And so that would be a step in the right direction. And it would provide a mechanism, perhaps an imperfect one, perhaps one that does not have all the teeth that we might like, but a mechanism that would allow uh, protection. A year ago in October and again last June, the courts affirmed a constitutional right of same-sex couples to marry, recognized a constitutional right that had existed for a long time. And yet we find in our community that there are people who are reluctant to get married or to live open, authentic lives because they're afraid that by being open and out and authentic. They're going to be evicted, or they're going to be excluded from accommodations, or they're going to be fired. Now this ordinance isn't going to fix all that, but it's going to be a step in the right direction. And so I agree with what Mr. Stevenson said a few moments ago. This is the beginning of a conversation. You should in the future consider a human rights commission like you used to have to take care of discrimination issues, not only as it relates to the LGBT community, but these other groups. Of, of race, religion, color, national origin, etc. None of them are getting the protection that they deserve, but that's not before you today. A, a, a very small step is before you. It represents progress, and I urge you to adopt this. Thank you for hearing from me. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Cindy Kaysen? I hope I pronounced it correctly. All right. Thank you all for considering this today. Um, I'm here today as a mom. I'm part of the group, my scarf, mothers of many in Norman. We formed in Norman um, after another suicide of one of our children. Amanda's story kind of put me on in the center and the heart of this matter. I guess this looks like a real mom thing here, um, but I want to assure you that the problem is real. Our children need the protections in whatever form you can offer them. Whether it's a baby step or everything that in my mom heart I hope for, for my child and for all of the children that I now mother as a surrogate mother because their families have rejected them. We've come a long way and I'm grateful to be able to stand here and at least talk about this today. And I hope you will give favorable consideration to the request today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cindy. All right. Ed, you want to? make the motion on the amendment? Well, I just, I, I just would, would say this. I, I think that once you become more and more of an outlier among cities, and, and I think of the cities that are larger than us, the super majority have protections for the LGBT community in terms of housing. You, you can be an outlier, but if you're going to be an outlier, you have to have a reason why you're not implementing it. And I, I think the burden is not so much on those who would come and speak in favor of it. It's those who would want the status quo, what, what is the reason for not doing it when, when Tulsa, Norman, Lawton, and almost every city that's larger that's in America is doing it? I think the burden shifts uh, to those who would want the status quo. I, I'm not sure that we are going above and beyond um, what's already been proposed. If you 
if you incorporate sexual orientation and gender identity into the term sex. If you accept that, that sex could be encompassing of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation, then we're not really adding anything different today. We're just incorporating it all under that umbrella. Um, I think that it does give, it gives legislative intent. I think that it would give potentially, it would be an argument in court if there were a civil action that this is the legislative intent of the Oklahoma City Council, that it's illegal in the city of Oklahoma City, and it would, it would give some teeth. I don't think that this and the Human Rights Commission are mutually exclusive or that they have to necessarily be considered at the same time. We could do this amendment and then certainly we can and should consider a Human Rights Commission uh, as, as soon as possible. May I just ask the question, Kenny, perhaps, because I had a couple of phone calls. I haven't had time. Um, you know, I just got back from vacation and I haven't had time to do a lot of the investigation myself, but I have had some calls questioning whether or not the AG's office has the authority to enforce this, if you will, for us. I mean, I certainly agree with the intent of the proposal. I just am curious about yes. those teeth. Uh, Councilman, the, the, the one thing I did was I made some phone calls, did some research, uh, because I, should, I believe there should be no discrimination, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, and I don't care who it is. And the one thing I was concerned was, is there an adequate remedy already on the books uh, for housing discrimination? And so I reached out to the, and, and the other thing that, that you taught me, Ed, uh, is there empirical evidence that there's a problem of this? I wanted to find that out. And that's the one thing that I'm concerned about this ordinance is that this wasn't considered when we had a public hearing. And um, when, you decide to, when you decide to create a protected class, you have huge constitutional issues, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, right to contract, and there are articles after articles that talk about that. And so what I was concerned about, is there a remedy? Is there, is there protection for housing discrimination already on the books in this area? And I feel comfortable that since 2012, HUD has adequate remedies that they provide, and I can give you the articles that support that um, through the, the Department of Housing. Um, I called the State Attorney General's office to talk to them about <coughs> what they would do with such a thing, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them. And so it's, it's my position today that protected classes if we're going to create a protected class, we need a, a, a large social debate on that. We need to hear from constitutional professors that can tell us what the implications of this act is. And, and the other thing uh, I, I want to do is I want to make sure uh, that everybody knows what we're about to do, because SOGI laws um, are, are being uh, attempted to be implemented all over the United States at this time. It hasn't been implemented at the United States Congress. It hasn't been uh, commented on by the United States Supreme Court. And so I don't feel that there's been a fair debate about this amendment that was brought late into the game. And so to answer your question, I believe that there are remedies through HUD, and I believe that there are remedies at the state attorney's office. And so, um, and, 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 and so I'm concerned about adopting this ordinance without a de debate, number one. And number two, I'm really concerned uh, about the, the subjective intent of the definitions. Uh, and, and I think that the definitions are, are somewhat ambiguous and open to large uh, debate and interpretation. Uh, Do you I want to respond, Ed? Oh, maybe at the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, David, go ahead. I'm, I've just got some questions as a result of, of Councilman Stonecipher's comments. Um, well, basically, with respect to the city of Tulsa and I guess Norman, although I don't know how long their uh, equal rights um, organizations have been in place. How many instances or complaints have they pursued? And the other question is the remedies that they have available to enforce this. I was surprised to hear that some municip municipalities provide for civil action at the municipal level, I thought that was always at the state level. Is, is that not true? That's going to be a state-by-state state determination. It, our court is only a court of limited jurisdiction on criminal misdemeanors and violations of ordinances. We have no civil authority. So it wouldn't be able to accept civil actions at the current time? No, not the municipal court. Okay. Well, so that would then mean uh, district court to file any type of action. Correct. Okay. And this 
this uh, amendment that we're talking about, it, it just says no discrimination should be allowed, but it doesn't provide for uh, penalties or, or actions should there ever be found to be discrimination. Now, if a complaint is made, it's just referred to the appropriate state or federal entity that would have jurisdiction over it. Okay. Well, then, this is just from a personal note. Um, you know, I live in a, uh, a neighborhood that have members of this uh, group, the LGBT uh, members, live in our neighborhoods. We have blacks, we have Asians, we have Hispanics, we have... Uh, Caucasians. Um, as I've spoken with builders, none of them have indicated that they've ever uh, denied selling a home or building a home to anyone because of any of those particular uh, issues being present. I just completed serving as a receiver for the past two years on about 15 different uh, rental properties and they ranged in size from six units to over 80 units. We never considered any of these issues. What we were concerned about were uh, issues such as are the tenants or the prospective tenants, have they created problems in their previous locations to where they're a problem to the other tenants? Uh, so that's why I would like to see if there have been instances in Tulsa and Norman where complaints have been filed and to what extent they were been, they've been able to successfully, successfully uh, pursue those complaints. So, so to that point, David, the City of Tulsa Council, City Council approved housing protections for the LGBT community unanimously about six months ago. So it's been very short. And Norman just did it a couple weeks ago. Okay. So I don't know that you're going to have the empirical data um, I'm not sure, well, I wouldn't expect anyone to tell a city councilman that they discriminate in housing. Um, I wouldn't expect, without these kind of protections on the books, for you to have the empirical data. Why, why would somebody challenge or bring something forward if, if it isn't on the book? So in this case, you put the protections on the book and then you get the empirical data, um, not, the, not the other way around. But through, through HUD and the civil rights, Vision of the Attorney General's office. There should be complaints that are being filed, and there should be empirical evidence as to whether this is a problem or not. And I just don't think we know the answer to that, and I don't think anybody's looked at it. And there may be evidence from Tulsa or other cities in Oklahoma uh, that have commissions, uh, that have an ordinance, and, and let's look and see if it is a problem before we make a decision. I, I do not want to discriminate against my gay friends. I don't want to discriminate against my friends that go to church on Sunday. I don't want to discriminate against my friends that don't go to church on Sunday. But I want to make sure that we are putting something on the book that doesn't have uh, constitutional implications that may affect the right to contract, may affect freedom of religion, may affect freedom of speech. I just don't think we know enough at this time. Well, if we do, we would have lots of company. We'd be, we'd be arm in arm with Tulsa, Norman, Lawton, and virtually every city that's larger than in the United States of America. We would not be on our own. We would be in, this, we would be in the supermajority. And it's those who don't um, advocate that would find themselves in the very small minority. I just don't want to head down a road premature where uh, we have SOGI laws, where you have the same effect that happened where it was voted down in Charlotte, where uh, in Houston there was a petition and there was a vote of the people um, that, that voted it down. If this has an impact on freedom of religion, if it discriminates against my right to association, under the First Amendment, the SOGI laws, and I want it discussed and I want it debated. And I don't want to decide it just because an amendment was made at the last minute and everybody didn't get a full debate. Well, we, I mean, I made it clear, in the, we, and we've been talking with city staff for more than a month that this was coming. How would you propose studying it? I mean, I, I guess my fear would be that it would just be shelved indefinitely. It, it's what you said. I mean, when we had the issue of, of the, the, the uh, uh, curbside, uh, ordinance and, and and you asked Chief City, what's what's your evidence? What what do you look at? And, and and he was able to provide evidence. And I think that's what we go out and we look and see if there's evidence if there's a problem. If there's a problem of discrimination we need to deal with. It. Uh, if we're just if we if we don't have evidence of it and there are adequate remedies. I want to make sure there are adequate remedies to protect against discrimination. Here since twenty twelve, HUD provides remedies. Uh, through the federal statute, 
uh, there's a civil rights uh, action under 1983 for equal protection. Uh, and so there are remedies if there is discrimination. Will we wipe out all discrimination in this country? Never. But we have an obligation to fight and stop as much discrimination as possible. What I was concerned about is, are there adequate remedies on the books now? And I believe there is at this time. Pete, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Uh, with regard to the idea of constitutionality, it, it is my belief that this laws of this type, ordinance of this type, have been passed by a number of communities for a number of years. Those that oppose it would certainly be here today citing constitutional cases where, they, where this type of ordinance had been declared unconstitutional. Yeah, Pete, when we had the public debate, uh, this wasn't, the, the well, amendment was public not on debate the has gone on all had across the this country. Come, it was not, it was not, it, it was not. I, I, I hear what you're saying, I just disagree with you. The, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, public debate has gone on all over this country about this very thing. And this, these ordinances and, and statutes and uh, have been passed in num numerous communities and numerous uh, uh, political jurisdictions over the years, and I don't know of one time where the constitutionality question has been held against this thing. So that's my first comment. The second one is the fact that it doesn't have a penalty doesn't mean that it doesn't work. One of the reasons I think it does work in other areas is because it's on the books that you shouldn't do it. It's just that simple. It's just public opinion has gone to, got to the point where you shouldn't discriminate and, and enunciating what it means to be discriminated against and what the classes of people that are discriminated against are, I think that in and of itself has slowed some discrimination down. Uh, I also think that the, the lack of a penalty is, is not an unusual, certainly not in Oklahoma. We, did, we had seatbelt uh, buckling laws for several years before we have a penalty, and eventually we got to the point where we made it a penalty. Um, the idea, when we have an attorney general who has spent most of his career fighting social change, that we would have, a, we would, you would be able to safely go to this attorney general and say, "I want you to prosecute this case," is. It, it, um, it's right out on the edge of incredulous to me. I mean, uh, you look at all the things that, have, that this attorney general, all the money that's been spent over the last six, seven years by this AG fighting social change of every kind, and you expect this guy to be your champion if you're discriminated against. I think I have a hard, hard, hard time putting my faith in that. Um, I, I, think, I do think the question of a human rights commission is, is a separate question and probably should be looked into. I think we ought to look into it. It is, um, I don't necessarily think because other people have them, we ought to have them. I have some serious questions, especially in the area of employment in Oklahoma, where we're at will state with regard to you can fire somebody from being redheaded or dyeing their hair red. Uh, it, it's hard for me to believe that a constitution that would hold, uphold that kind of employer rights would then, Oklahoma City voluntarily gave that, those rights away by, doing, by passing the ordinance that we passed a couple years ago. But the employers across the state have not done that. And I, I wonder, just, I just wonder out loud about the constitutionality of that, my, to, to make that kind of restrictions on, on private employers. Um, but, but I think this step, we ought to take this step, and we ought to ask that we look at uh, the possibility of, of forming a human rights commission, not the possibility of forming one, uh, a study as to whether or not we ought to do it or not. not, not with the idea that we're going to do it, how do we get there, but the idea we look at a human rights commission, why we, I have a personal feeling about why it was disbanded the last time, but, but we ought to look at what's going on across the country with human rights commissions. Is it time, 2016, is, it, is today the time to look at human, another human rights commission? How, the, how it would be constituted in terms of whether you would constitute like you do other boards and commission with an, with an appointment uh, recommended by the council and appointed by the mayor, or the mayor just appoint five people to it, or how, all those things we ought to look at. I think it's time that we do that. 
but I think this is, is a step that we ought to take today. Okay. Pete, with respect to uh, employment, not to get too far ahead of this question, but a human rights commission, I believe, my understanding is the EOC currently includes um, sexual orientation in its interpretation of the word sex, so you can't discriminate based upon sex. They take it and say that includes sexual orientation. Certainly HUD includes that. And I think this past year the federal government again issued at an administrative ruling that says as it relates to federal contracts over a certain amount, you cannot have uh, discrimination occurring the contractor cannot have uh, discrimination occurring in it, and they, I think they were specific as it relates to sexual orientation in that administrative ruling. So uh, we could have that as a human rights commission, but if there's agencies already in place that are looking at that, I mean, are we just asking for you know, more work on our part knowing that we would eventually turn that case over to those agencies to pursue. That would be a reasonable argument against a, a Human Rights Commission. I think that's a reasonable discussion to have against the Human Rights Commission. I, I'm not saying that I agree with that, but yeah. I think it's a reasonable discussion. I don't think it's a reasonable discussion against adding these, this language to this ordinance. I just, I, I just, I don't see, you know, it's not that slippery a slope by putting this in something that's already occurring ever, virtually everywhere and through a kind of a loose interpretation of the word sex, it's, it's occurring. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see that as problematic. Uh, and I do think it might, the bully pulpit effect of that might make it more difficult for people to do something they shouldn't be doing. Right. Now, I believe as a, uh, a government agency, when we address the issue of sexual orientation with respect to our own internal employment uh, rules, that that was an appropriate issue. And I, you know, I'm kind of torn halfway and halfway on this issue in that I think that same opportunity should certainly be rendered in the area of housing because everybody should be given the right to pursue uh, housing you know in a fair manner I think it exists already and uh, even without this I, I don't see I'm not aware of much now that's you know I'm certainly limited in my activities but I don't know of discrimination occurring right now in the area above housing. But the other part concerns me when somebody from a business perspective, now we're taking it a step further, who has a business and says, you know, I live in a free country and I can choose who I want to do business with. And if I have a concern such as the baker who uh, didn't want to provide a cake for a a uh, gay wedding didn't want to sell to them or didn't want to make a cake you know for that instance you know that other part of me tells me hey that person has a right from a free enterprise system to choose who to do business with uh, that's the same right that the white cafe owner has to refuse service to a black man I, I don't think it does Pete. well I, that's just that's just <laughs> I, I, I just, that's, we, we just differ there. I just believe that, I know. that when you start to discriminate based on things that are um, uh, beyond the control of the person that you're discriminating against, the color of his skin, the religion, uh, his, his sexual orientation, once the, you, you start to discriminate against people for those things, you've crossed the line. You've crossed the line into, in my, that's my view. Otherwise, no, otherwise, you can make that argument about the baker and the, and the wedding cake. You can make it about the 
I, I don't know what, what any of you have had experiences. I'm older than most of you, but can we go back to kind of the simplest form here, which is well, that, that's really that's my point, Meg. This is this doesn't involve that stuff. This involves saying that it's inappropriate and illegal without a, without a remedy to um, discriminate against people based on sexual orientation, sexual preference. That's and, all it is. And in this ordinance, this amendment, all we're doing is expanding the definition. It exactly. currently says sex. Exactly. We could argue that that already covers this, and we don't need to do this. Right. But this does expand that definition only. But, is that but if we can, analogize, am I clear? Can I, can I ask <laughs> you start to analogize about what, what's discriminatory and what's not discriminatory, that's where you get into, that's where you bring in the other kinds of discrimination that you know, people have fought and died to, per, to prevent. I just don't think, and I understand that people can have a different viewpoint. I mean, if, if, we, if there weren't different viewpoints, Donald Trump, Ronald Trump would have been out of the presidential race a long time ago. But I, that's just my viewpoint. I'm willing to vote, and however it goes out, it'll, it'll go out, but I'm going to vote to add the the, uh, to it because that's what I believe. And I believe it's a mistake not to do it. But that's not a test of fellowship. We'll all be here next Tuesday. Yeah. Well, we we are, I, think we, I think it's a mistake not to debate what appropriate protected class is. I understand. That's, that's why over time uh, we amended the Constitution. Uh, we had the Fair Housing Act. We had the I, American I, with Disabilities Act. I understand. And for us to do an amendment at the last minute and not even talk about the ramifications of this protected class and what are those definitions uh, the, the debate across the country is those two terms are ambivalent those two terms have ambiguities and so for us to just quickly decide this issue i think is wrong uh, there can, can i ask to mark's and point discussion. and mark we, d we did talk about the ramifications at length four years ago so this body has discussed those ramifications at length four I, years I didn't ago get to Enjoy that I understand debate. That. And I didn't get to enjoy hearing some constitutional law professor tell me that this may affect uh, the, the freedom of speech. The SOGI laws uh, may have some impact. And if it does affect people uh, that want to go to church and practice their religion, I want to have that debate. I want to discuss that. And I want to make sure those people are protected too. Okay, Kenny, so I just want to ask so without the amendment, we are saying today we're amending our housing protection laws and we are adding, we're saying, to David's point, that the baker cannot discriminate against which class, which are we adding without the amendment? Without, without the amendment, you're adding age, familial status, and disability. That's which what, are all protected classes that have been discussed and debated by the United States Congress right, right. and decided and, and addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. None of that has happened here. Right. I'm just going to David's point that, that the but that we are saying to private property owners you can't discriminate based on age, familial status, and disability, disability, sex, gender, ethnic origin, religion. You cannot discriminate based on religion. Uh, and so basically this amendment just adds sexual orientation and gender identity into the, into the sex clause. Did, did we get an answer as to whether in our contracts we there's precedent for putting sexual orientation and gender identity under the sex definition. Cindy Richard is here. Councilman, we have uh, added that language in some of our contracts, um, generally those that are covered by MAPS funding. It, it, that language is not specifically and overtly found in our other contracts with the city. Um, there is some basis for an argument that the word gender could include uh, these other subgroups, um, but it could also be argued that it's not. Okay, so by making, by voting for the amendment, we're basically clarifying that yes, sexual orientation and gender identity is included in sex. There's some precedent for it in our contracts, our MAPS contracts. I think to the larger point, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure why the Human Rights Commission was disbanded in 1996. I know that. There's many, many people from the LGBT community and just other communities whose impression is that the council disbanded it because of LGBT issues. And I think that's, that speaks to the larger issue, is that voting for the amendment is an affirmation 
Um, it, it goes to that perception. I think in the Gazette article this weekend, it also wrote about that, that, that I mean, their conclusion was that the council disbanded the Human Rights Commission because of LGBT issues. I think this reverses a lot of that. and It, it affirms the community, and it, and it clarifies what the term sex means. Larry? Yeah, I'd just <clears throat> like to make so everybody knows where I'm coming from. When, when we cut down to a vote on this, I'm going to vote against adding this amendment to it. Uh, I think it was very timely that yesterday in the paper there was a large page devoted with the headline, a State Houses Plan Renewed Debates Over LGBT Rights, Religious Freedom, and Budgets. That was State Houses. It did not speak about the state of Oklahoma, but this is a topic that has national implications. Uh, in the same article, it was mentioned, and Mark has already mentioned that, that in Houston, uh, they just had a referendum election back in November over this wording, and it was turned down by, the, uh, by a vote of the people. So everybody is not in favor of this. This uh, article had another very interesting thing. It said, uh, there are some people uh, that who have a sincere belief, religious or not, in natural marriage. I happen to be in that class, and uh, that covers my thinking, I understand, and I believe that this is a step in the wrong direction, and therefore I'm going to respectfully vote against it. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Ed, you want to make your motion? All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9E1. This is an Mayor, amendment to the ordinance. Before we do that, I'm sorry to get you at the last moment, but. We were uh, this close. I know it. <laughs> to vote. Uh, I still have a concern. If I can go back to that previous example, Pete. If a couple, let's say, have a, a spare room over their garage mm -hmm. that they'd like to rent out, and their relig religious beliefs says, you know what, I don't want to condone uh, that kind of lifestyle, so I'd prefer not to rent out to people of the LBGT uh, community. We're taking that person's right away, I believe, with this ordinance. And that part disturbs me, to take that person's ability to rent out a spare room in that kind of a situation. Uh, it talks about a SOGI laws and the impact it has on freedom, not just with housing, uh, but as to First Amendment rights. And, and it's, it's, it's very concerning, very troublesome. And I think we need to think about this and we need to debate it more. I'm not suggesting it ends here. I'm suggesting that we do not have enough information in front of us to make a proper decision on the constitutional ramifications of us deciding a protected class that hasn't been decided by the United States Supreme Court, the United States Congress, the President of the United States, or the Oklahoma Supreme Court. David, it wasn't that long ago that it was illegal to have interracial marriages. And right. people cited religious reasons why they felt that interracial marriages were wrong and that they w were able to discriminate against. And the city, state, federal government, fortunately, all found that unfounded. No, I understand, Ed. I, I really do. And I would like to never see any type of discrimination occur. But yet, again, going back to my example, uh, a couple who have been brought up in a uh, environment to where uh, they felt like that that was not uh, a proper uh, lifestyle. Just like I don't believe, and I wouldn't want to condone my children, for example, uh, to live together outside of wedding, outside of marriage. Now, I may be considered old fashioned in that regard, but I don't think it's right, you know? Uh, and so to force uh, that couple to say, you can't get that extra income, you know, by renting that apartment over your garage out, uh, unless you're willing to take anybody, uh, without some additional study, as Mark suggests. Now, I, again, I want this to hopefully move forward and be... Uh, enacted, but I think Mark brings out a point that I have to 
support, just like I felt necessary to agree with you and Pete on extending uh, the issue with respect to panhandling until the, the uh, people opposed to it had more time to put together a plan. You know, I don't think this issue is going to go away. So if we were to extend this <coughs> a couple of weeks to allow that research and debate to take place, I don't think we're hurting anybody. And again, without evidence of instances of this occurring, it's not like we're receiving complaints after complaints after complaints that there's been that there is currently discrimination going on. I, I mean, there are legal scholars that firmly believe that SOGI laws impact uh, freedom of religion. And I think that that debate needs to occur, and we need to discuss that. Does this action affect other First Amendment rights? It's, for example, Hobby Lobby went all the way to the Supreme Court to fight for its religious freedom. And so if these laws, on the whole, impact um, uh, freedom of religion, I think that debate needs to occur. Mark, how, I'm, make a proposal. I mean, with the panhandling, we had a six-month deadline. There was a, a plan in writing. I mean, how would you propose that we hear from these constitutional scholars and, and have this debate, but not have it be just shelved indefinitely. At the end of the day, I think that, that there needs to be a public debate. When that needs to occur, where that needs to occur, how long it needs to take for it to occur. I, I think one of the things that comes to mind is, is there empirical evidence of a problem? And that needs to be researched. Is that, is that two months? Is that six months? I don't know, the, the city staff would be better to answer that than me. Yeah, you know, Ed, I think you ought to see if you got the votes. Yeah, let's see. And, yeah. and then we, if okay. not, then you can... You well, know. we can study it either way. Right. Yeah. Well, one, one, one last comment. What? I think it boils down to what the way people look at the Constitution. The Constitu I knew the Constitution would be an argument today. The way people, some, some people look at the Constitution as the right, as, as, a, as a set of words designed to protect the discriminator. Other people look at the Constitution as a document designed to protect those discriminate, to prevent discrimination. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. We're more worried about what somebody's religious beliefs are who won't be affected one way or the other by having a gay couple live in their garage apartment. It won't, if it, if it challenges their religious beliefs, they need to work on their marriage, in my opinion. It, it, it's, not, it's not something that challenges your belief. It's just preventing you from discriminating against somebody else. You, you're, they're, they're, this couple that is so worried about a gay couple, um, they're still comfortable in their house. I, I, I just don't see how discrimination against somebody that doesn't agree with them is some raises some kind of a constitutional issue. I just, but I recognize if you do believe that, yeah. you're going to believe. Mark, I think, believes that. Well, I, and I, it's just a difference. It's like which side of the bed you sleep on. Yeah. You know, you. Couple of comments. One, I think the Constitution isn't trying to uh, provide favoritism on one side of the issue or not. They're just saying everybody's entitled to certain inevitable rights. You know, right. unalienable rights. I mean. Uh, that they are God-given rights, that government can't take certain rights from us. And that's what the Constitution well, provides for. Now, the, the, the other part the other is if we that. were to make exceptions like single-unit rental properties wouldn't be subject to these rules, for example, or something like that. You see that yeah. with a lot of the rules from the federal government that employers of less than a certain number, for example, are not subject to these same rules. Uh, if you're in the trader business of renting out apartments, I think you should be subject to these rules. Right. You know, and so I'm just asking, I'll, without Mark providing an exception, I would offer to come back and look at this question with the opportunity for debates on both sides a month from today. All right, are we ready to vote? All right. Everybody ready? Cast your votes. The amendment passes 5-4.
Now we need to vote on the uh, ordinance, item 9E2. Is there a motion?